Well, hello everybody and welcome to another episode. Has there ever been a better time to be a photographer? I'm really not sure there has. We're now freed from the constraints of film. Film was very nice, still is very nice, but it is a little bit fussy. We can now shoot on limited digital images. We have access to a whole range of digital mirrorless cameras that will shoot modern lenses and all the old vintage lenses as well. So really I can't think of any better time there's ever been to be a photographer. Some of these mirrorless cameras are now getting very, very cheap and they're very, very accessible in all sensor formats, micro four thirds, APS-C and full frame. So we've looked at quite a few of them over the past few months on this channel but I thought it's time to do a bit of a roundup, bring them all together and show you what's available in all of the sensor formats. The cheapest of the cameras I'm going to look at today starts from around £50. The most expensive goes up to around four, £500 and all points betwixt and between. So without further yakking from me, let's have a look at our choices. So we'll start with Micro Four Thirds and the first camera I'm going to show you today is this one. This is the Panasonic GH2. Now this is a lovely little camera and in fact this was my first mirrorless camera and I bought it around about, well gosh when was it? I think it was around about 2012, 2013 and I've used it and used it and used it. I've made lots and lots of the videos for this channel with this camera, particularly in the early days, and I shot lots of the stills for it as well. Um, and it's just a very nice little camera. It does very nice video. It's always had very nice video. It's, I guess it's not the most competitive video these days, uh, but it's still quite nice and you can hack this camera to get better video. You can get a very, very high standard of video out of this camera if you use, I think it's the Magic Lantern hack, if that can still be found. Now a great thing I always liked about this camera is the flippy out screen. I think that's such a boon. <sighs> A lot of photographers aren't particularly interested by it, but I think if you do a bit of video as well, then this becomes a really good feature because you can turn the camera around and see what you're shooting. So it's really good for blogging or vlogging uh, in that way. You can see very clearly what's going on on the screen there. So it's fantastic in that sense. And I think a flippy screen is a really useful thing to have. Stills, the stills from this camera are nice, but Panasonic colours are perhaps not the best. They're certainly not as good as Olympus colours. They're okay, they're all right. You can tune them if you play around with white balance and settings. You can get a fairly nice colour balance on this, but I never really rated the Panasonic colours, certainly in comparison to Olympus colours or, or Sony colours or those from more or less any uh, camera manufacturer I can think of. It's not that they're awful, they just don't have quite that magic that the other ones have, but it does shoot very competent stills and you can mount any vintage lens on this camera. I've used a Jupiter 8 a lot. In fact, this very Jupiter 8 sitting here, this is a lens from 1968 or 67, I think. Now I've used this and used this and used this. Don't forget there's a crop factor on micro four thirds bodies so that any lens you or any vintage lens you mount, in fact, even any modern lens you mount, will give an effective focal length of double what's marked on the body and that's not magic it's just optics it's because the sensor is smaller so the field of view is smaller 
also. So this 50mm lens works as a 100mm lens when you mount it on this camera, but that's fine for me. I like a focal length around about 100mm and I don't see any problem with micro four thirds in that regard. It has been difficult to get wide angle lenses for these micro four thirds cameras, especially if you're shooting vintage lenses. But there are a number of um, new manual focus lenses coming from the Chinese manufacturers which fill that gap really well. There's a very nice 17 millimeter which I looked at a few weeks ago and there are various other wide options from the Chinese manufacturers that make micro four thirds a very viable system and they give a really uh, good, they're really good at filling that wide gap uh, at budget prices. One thing this uh, camera doesn't have is focus peaking and for me that is a bit of a disadvantage because just looking through the viewfinder, certainly looking on the screen but also looking through the viewfinder, it's not too easy to find critical focus quickly. Um, it may be that um, my eyesight is not quite up to the job anymore. You may find it diff uh, easier if you have a younger pair of eyes, but for me, peaking is an omission on here. But nevertheless, it's still a nice camera. You can use it um, without too much difficulty. I've used lots of vintage lenses on it and never had too many problems, but I do miss that peaking. All in all, though, a very nice little camera. And a really good camera to take your first steps in mirrorless photography with vintage lenses or indeed with modern lenses but it's perfect for trying out uh, trying out vintage lenses because it's so cheap prices for these start from around about a hundred pounds or so and for that you will find a good one a very nice little camera and worthy of consideration especially if you want to just dip a toe into the waters and um, see if this whole mirrorless malarkey is right for you. So that is Panasonic. We've also got an Olympus Micro Four Thirds with us today. We've looked at this camera very recently, so I'm not going to talk too much about it now. It's the Olympus EM10, uh, OMD EM10. It's a beautiful little camera it's very very small it's much smaller than the gh2 much smaller in pretty much every dimension with the exception of height it's certainly much thicker you can see there the gh2's got a big grip on it and this one doesn't so it's a much wider body um at least in the front to rear dimension and also it's very different in the uh, width dimension also it is a little less wide can you see that <laughs> I'm not doing this very well am I can you see that more clearly yes I think you can so you can see that the GH2 is actually a little wider than the Olympus though actually there isn't as much as I thought in it in that dimension beautiful beautiful little camera wonderful wonderful Olympus colors it's very well made with a metal body, whereas the GH2 is plastic. It takes all the vintage lenses and all the, all the um, modern micro four thirds lenses too. And it's a wonderful little camera. It has two control wheels. It's got a PASM dial over here, so all the settings will be familiar if you're coming from another uh, digital camera, if you've shot DSLR in the past maybe. It's just a beautiful little thing. This camera's strength is stills. It's really, really good for stills. It's got fantastic colour balance and the images are just lovely. Absolutely beautiful out of this camera. Video's nice as well, but it's not so good as it is on the GH2. The GH2's got full manual control on video. It shoots at 24 frames a second. This one doesn't have so much manual control while you're shooting video and it's limited only to 30 frames a second, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, 
but if you've got other cameras, if you're using it as a B-roll camera maybe, um, that could cause difficulties if you want to keep the frame rates the same. But a very, very nice little camera. One massive advantage it has over the GH2 is focus peaking. It has to be set by pressing this button. It doesn't come on automatically. And in fact, it's not the best peaking system I've ever used because it's not there all the time. You do have to switch it on. But it is there and it does work and it does achieve critical focus for you and I'd take the peaking in this camera over no peaking any day of the week. Beautiful little camera available for around about 130 to 150 pounds. This is a really really nice camera to begin with. It's a better camera for stills than the GH2 and it's only a little more expensive. Very very nice indeed. Full review on the previous video to this one so have a look at that for more information. Also from Olympus are the pen cameras the EP1, EP2 etc. I'm not sure what we're up to now I think it's EP10 that we're at now but these cameras are lovely lovely little things. They're a rangefinder style camera they don't have the prison hump that the uh, E uh, EM1 has over here. Instead they're a, a, a sort of a flat body finish and they do look much more like one of the old rangefinder cameras although then they're, they're not even as big as this Leica 2. They're very very small. In fact they're about the same size bodily as the EM1 and you can see the EM1 is actually quite a bit smaller widthways than the like a two so they're very very small cameras they're neat they're discreet and they're very very stylish as well in fact i can't really think of a more stylish mirrorless camera than the pen series the original pen the ep1 is now a serious serious bargain it starts from around 50 pounds and you can sometimes even get a lens thrown in with that as well it's a nice little camera. It'll shoot any vintage lens, just like any other mirrorless camera. And it will also shoot all the micro four thirds lenses. Autofocus can be slightly uh, slower than some of the more modern cameras, though I didn't really find that to be any handicap. There is no focus peaking and the screen is not an articulating screen in any direction. It just sits flat on the body and doesn't move. But it's a very, very, very nice little camera. It's a great snapshot camera. You can carry it with you. It's portable and it's just a lovely little thing. Video is not its strong point. It will only do 720p. So don't buy this camera for video. In fact, don't buy any of the uh, Olympus EP cameras if you want the best in video because they're not really tuned for video. They're more tuned towards stills with the occasional video shot. So the EP1 is really, really affordable at the moment from around about £50. The EP5, which uh, rather the EPL5, which I tested some time ago, a beautiful little camera, a uh, higher pixel count than the EP1. The EP1 is 12 megapixels. You don't really need any more than that, but if you want more, the later EP cameras have more and I think the EP5 is it's either 16 or 20 megs um, both of which provide far more than you actually need plenty of resolution there no problem at all again they're very very stylish cameras and they're very very beautiful and good looking cameras as well so if that's important to you these are good cameras to go for. The EPL5 does have focus peaking as does the EPL8 which I also tested a little while ago and as I recall it's a rather better peaking system than we find on the EM1 here in that it's permanently on and you do get a choice of colours which you don't get in the EM1. That's important. What you want from a focus peaking system is 
contrast. You need to be able to see that contrast. If you only have one colour, white, uh, for example, as we have over here on the EM1, then there will be occasions where you can't see that peaking because it's blending into the colour of the background. You really need, strictly speaking, to be able to change those colours to give uh, contrast in all the situations you're going to meet. And that is a really good feature to have. It makes peaking much easier. They're very well made little cameras. They all have metal bodies. There's no, as I recall, there's no inbuilt viewfinder uh, but you can get a nice little uh, add-on viewfinder that sits on the top on the hot shoe and that gives you all the functionality of um, a camera with a viewfinder, although it does add a little extra space. The EPL5 and the EPL8 both have articulating screens, but sadly they don't flip out and you can't see them from the front, which is important to me because I shoot uh, quite a bit of video. Uh, it may not be important to you if you're interested more in stills and you want these cameras to capture still images. Of course, they have the beautiful Olympus colours, which are second to none. And all the EP cameras have uh, those colours and that colour science and all of the engines that drive it. Very highly developed colour science in the Olympus cameras. The EPL5 can be found for around about £100. The EPL8 is more expensive, uh, perhaps around £150. But still, these are not expensive cameras. And they're all, in fact, great ways to get started in mirrorless photography. Again, if you want to dip a toe into the water and see if it's for you. They're also great cameras for portability. They're wonderful for travel. It's sometimes said that the small sensor that Micro Four Thirds cameras have, the relatively small sensor, doesn't give you, doesn't afford as many opportunities for shallow depth of field. And yes, that's true. But, you know, if you, if you stick a lens, uh, a longer lens on your Micro Four Thirds camera or a wide aperture lens on your Micro Four Thirds camera, it's very easy to uh, create all the background blur that you want so it's not really a handicap it's just a question of a slightly different technique using slightly wider aperture openings and longer focal lengths to give you the blur uh, if that's what you're after but lovely little cameras well worth looking at if you're uh, looking for a mirrorless digital camera to get started with very very nice machines indeed So next up in our sensor size odyssey, we're going to have a look at APS-C cameras. APS-C cameras have a slightly smaller sensor than the full frame sensor. It's the same size as the advanced photo system film of the 90s. And it's also roughly the same size as a 35mm motion picture camera. So it's a very usable sensor and it's a very nice sensor as well. There's a crop factor with APS-C of about one third so that means any lens that you put on an APS-C body, let's say you put a 50mm lens on an APS-C body, well one third as much again is 75 so it behaves as a 75mm lens so every lens you put on an APS-C camera is going to be slightly longer it's going to work slightly longer about a third longer than it would on a full frame camera to give you some idea of the crop that's going on first camera I'd like to talk about is a Sony camera it's the Sony a6000 beautiful little camera very very popular many many uh, hundreds of thousands of them sold Sony APS-C cameras uh, have been going for many, many years and they began with the NEX series. So the NEX 3, I think, was the first one. Um, and you can still buy those cameras today. They're very, 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 very cheap. Incredible bargains. I'm not talking about the A6000 now. I'm talking about the 
earlier cameras, the Sony NEX3, the NEX5. Some of those don't have separate viewfinders, but I think they all have articulating screens, but sadly not flippy ones. So the A6000 is a, a sort of a later iteration of those NEX cameras. They're very small and compact. And when I used the A6000, I was struck by how similar it was to the A7, uh, the full frame A7 that I've got sitting here and that I've used to shoot so many of the images on the channel with. And they are like a shrunk down a7 the controls are very similar the menus are very similar i find the menu system on sony cameras to be very nice and very clear um, the resolution on the a6000 is about what is it now i think it's 24 megapixels and that's really far more resolution than anyone could reasonably need you don't really need any more than five in my view unless you're blowing up prints to enormous size you know the size of a house or something um, but certainly the a6000 is uh, has plenty of resolution 24 megs on its sensor earlier cameras i think maybe have 20 or 16 uh, the nex7 i think was the first one to have 24 megapixels the a6000 is available at around about 250 to 300 pounds for a good one and that's a fair price for the camera it's a very very nice little camera very very capable little camera the colors are fantastic the build quality is excellent it's a nice small little camera it's got plenty of resolution it's got a very high res viewfinder and it has sony's focus peaking which is i found anyway one of the best peaking systems that there is in fact i think the peaking on the Sony a7 is the best peaking that I've uh, seen on any camera. It's slightly less prominent in the a6000 than it is on the a7, but it's still very, very strong, very, very clear. And unlike the EM1 there, you don't have to switch it on. It is permanently on. Again, unlike the EM1, you can look at the image and have peaking and exposure information together you can't do that on the em1 so the sony system is better for peaking there's no doubt about it and all in all the a6000 is a very capable very competent mature mirrorless camera and 250 to 300 pounds is a very very good price for one it's a pretty modern camera it's a fairly recent camera and you can still buy them new that's how recent they are so it's it's not going to become too dated anytime soon a very very nice camera indeed and one that i recommend if you're looking for a mirrorless camera an aps-c mirrorless camera with a really good spec and a really good build quality other APS-C cameras I've tried recently include the Fujifilm cameras, the X-T10, the X-T1 and the X-T2. And I must say, I've become very enamoured with the Fujifilm system after discovering it far too late, round about November last year. And the reason I like these cameras is the philosophy behind them. I think they were designed by people who really know photography, who've shot plenty of film, who know what good colours are, who know what photographers want. These are really our photographers' cameras. And the best thing about them, one of the best things about them, is their film simulation modes. They're absolutely beautiful. As you may know, Fujifilm um, made and still do make a number of very beautiful, very successful film stocks so they've got the color science knowledge and understanding there within their company and they've applied it to these film simulations they really work very very well indeed oh there's another one i didn't mention actually which is the x pro one i've also looked at that camera so the film simulations on these cameras are the unique selling point and they're beautiful and not only do they come with bundled film simulations you can also cook your own from uh, among various um, 
place is the Fuji X Weekly website. There's lots of other recipes out there on the web as well. And they're really, really successful. Coupled with that is the fact that these cameras are designed to resemble a film camera in their shooting. So they really are fantastic for that. Let me grab one and show you. So here as an example, we've got the X-T2, which in fact I was just shooting video with. So I'm going to have to be careful to keep that focus the same and try and not shift it. But yeah, the X-T2 is a beautiful camera and it's very representative of the uh, Fuji X cameras in general. On the top here, we've got an exposure compensation dial, a shutter speed dial and an ISO dial. And that set of controls makes this camera just wonderful to use. And it applies to the other cameras in the range as well. I began my uh, Fuji Odyssey by uh, with rather an XT. 10 which are pretty cheap cameras at the moment you can buy one of those for 150 to 175 pounds there are different versions of the sensor this is a very unusual sensor that goes into these cameras it's a non bayer arrangement of pixels which means that the pixels are better able to capture light and color and all of the visual information uh, that a camera needs to have to make very nice images. There's no AA filter, no anti-aliasing filter on these uh, sensors, which makes for sharper images. They are very, very sharp indeed, these images. Um, in the X-T2 here, we have the X-Trans 3 sensor in the X-T1 and X-T10. The sensor is the same. That's the X-Trans 2. And in the X-Pro one, we have the X-Trans 1. I have to say that the earliest sensors do seem to make the nicest, most film-like images. So of those, the X-Pro 1 is probably the um, prime example. It does make very, very beautiful, very, very film-like images and it's generally a lovely camera. The only problem with the X-Pro1 is that they are now becoming a bit of a cult camera, so prices are rising. You can expect to, uh, to pay £250 to £300 for a good one. It does have the earliest version of the sensor though, and it's not that flexible. It doesn't come with too many bundled onboard film sims, and there aren't too many that you can cook for it either. Plus, the peaking isn't the best on the X-Pro1. I think the best of the bunch, if, if you're coming new to Fuji cameras and you want to try it, see if it's for you, the best of the bunch is probably the X-T10. It's got the second generation of the sensor. It doesn't have, it's missing one of the dials. I think it's the exposure compensation dial, but that's no real handicap. Same sensor as the X-T1. Comes with plenty of bundled film sims and there's much more possibility for cooking your own as well. Uh, that's a 16 megapixel sensor, which is more than enough for anybody's needs. But the only thing with those early, uh, earlier cameras, the X-Pro one, the X-T one, the X-T10, the video is not the best. And if you want continuous autofocus on video, then that certainly isn't the best either. They're not natural video cameras. You can grab the odd clip here and there and it'll look fine for casual use, but don't uh, don't expect the video to hold up for anything more. The X-T2 video is absolutely beautiful. It can do 4K and it does 1080 very nicely as well. And it's got a much better um, algorithm for constant autofocus while you're in video, while you're shooting video, and that actually does work really well on this camera. As far as costs go, the X-T10 is the cheapest. You can buy a nice one from around 150 to 175 pounds body only. X-T1, expect to pay around 250 pounds for a good one. An X-Pro1, 
somewhere between 250 to 300 maybe more xt2 around about 400 body only i think if you want to dip a toe into these waters have a look at an xt10 it's a beautiful camera and these are unique cameras nobody else is doing this in the industry fuji have the market if you want a film look and if you want something approximating a good approximation of the experience of using a film camera absolutely lovely cameras highly recommended and so we come to the full frame section of today's little roundup i got two full frame cameras to talk to you about the first is the canon 5d mark one and that is rapidly becoming something of a cult camera it's very very cheap at the moment i bought one to test for 175 pounds and i also sold it for 175 pounds so that's about the value for that you get a 12 megapixel sensor with canon's fantastic color science and it really is fantastic canon are well known for beautiful colors 12 megapixel full frame sensor it's a traditional dslr this is not a mirrorless camera but it can shoot many but not all vintage lenses i shot olympus lenses on it with great success no problem at all the only problem was that focusing for me was difficult because clearly there isn't any um, assisted mechanism on these cameras there's no peaking there's no magnification however you can get a screen with um, a uh, focusing ground glass focusing prism uh, built into it so you can use the um, Canon 5D Mark I just as you did an old SLR a film SLR with one of those screens inside it and if you get one of these cameras that's the way to go that takes you back to the very efficient very effective method of focusing by a ground glass screen just as we used to do on the film SLRs and it works I'm told very nicely I've not actually tried one but it does work very nicely um, according to all the reports I've read having said that focusing isn't particularly difficult with this one just with the eye looking through the viewfinder it's not a particularly large viewfinder but it's nice and clear and you can find critical focus by using it a really good full frame option and the cheapest full frame camera that i know of just at the moment i don't think there are any cheaper than this the 5d mark ii goes for it seems around about three to four hundred pounds from what i can see this one goes for 175 i've even seen them for 150 so if you want to dip a toe into the waters of full frame digital imaging this is a really good way to do it what's so good about full frame well there's nothing inherently better about a full frame sensor than a crop sensor except that if you want to shoot vintage lenses on it the whole character of the lens will come through because there's no crop on a full frame body vintage lenses like these were made for 35 millimeter film full frame sensors have a sensor the same size as a piece of 35 mil film so the whole character the full character of these lenses comes through no cropping no crop factor all of the lenses projected image falls onto the sensor if that's important to you as it kind of is to me i like to appreciate the full quality of these old lenses this is a camera that permits it an absolute bargain a great way to dip your toe into the waters of full frame digital imaging and there are plenty around grab one before prices go up because i think they might for this one finally last but by no means least is my old workhorse here the sony a7 the full frame sony a7 i bought this camera back in when was it i think about 2015 
and I've used it and used it I've and used it. I've taken pretty much every lens uh, test shot for this channel using this camera. I've shot thousands and thousands of images with it. This one's now up to a shot account of 50,000 and it still performs flawlessly. So quality of manufacture is good as well. It's a very small camera and to fit a full frame sensor into this small body is really quite astonishing. It's not that much bigger than a Sony a6000. In fact, the rear portion here, if you discount the uh, hump, the, the uh, viewfinder hump, the rear portion here is pretty much the same size as an a6000 body and that's a stunning technical accomplishment. If I compare it to this old Leica here, the Leica 2, which is my standard for small cameras, my gold standard for small cameras, you can see that it's actually, what, a millimeter smaller in size widthways. So almost the same in that dimension. And well, quite a bit taller with the hump on the top, but without the hump, then not too much taller at all. It's rather deeper on this side, but not so much on this side where the body is actually quite slim. So, the, so you can see this is a very, very portable, very small uh, full frame camera. Adding lenses to it, of course, especially vintage lenses, well, you're going to need an adapter, so that does add a little bit of length. However, there are plenty of full frame lenses coming out of the Chinese optical factories of very high standard, which will go onto this camera without uh, an adapter. And that's true of micro four thirds cameras and APS-C cameras also. So you don't have to use vintage lenses if you want to shoot manual, you don't have to use an adapter. And in fact, the combination becomes actually quite small. Uh, doing that. This camera has 24 megapixels of resolution. This is the original A7 Mark I. After this iteration, they became progressively higher and higher in resolution. I don't know where they're at now with, with these uh, cameras, but it's a lot more than 24 megs. But you don't need any more than 24 megs to make a stunning image. It's got a screen on the back which does not fold out, uh, does not flip out as I'd like it to. However, it does articulate up and down in the conventional mirrorless camera manner so that if you want to shoot something very low to the ground, you can do. And uh, it's a very high res screen. The peaking system is brilliant on this camera. It's the best I've seen on any mirrorless camera that I've used. It's very prominent. The colours will change and it remains on screen permanently, unlike the Olympus system, which you have to actually switch on. So this is a very, very uh, good camera if you want a good peaking system. I haven't found any problem with this camera as I've been using it. I've found it makes beautiful images. If you're a regular viewer to this channel, you will have seen thousands of those images on the videos that I've made. It's been an absolute workhorse. It's small, it's light enough, it's pocketable. It, well, it's not pocketable really, is it? But it's the point I'm trying to make is it. this is not a big camera to take around with you all day. In fact, the Fuji X-T cameras are bigger and heavier than this one is, which is actually quite surprising. I, I, I can't understand why those Fuji X cameras are not a little smaller than these uh, Sony full frame cameras, but they're not. The fact is, this is a small, svelte, sleek body that you can take with you anywhere you want to go. Prices for these cameras are now becoming seriously cheap, or at least in relative terms. When I bought this camera, I paid a thousand pounds for it. You can now buy this camera new for around about five to six hundred pounds second hand. I've seen them for three fifty, four hundred pounds. They don't come along often at that price, but they do come along and they are out there. So this is a very cheap way into full frame 
mirrorless photography and unlike the Canon 5D Mark I, this will shoot all vintage lenses. Pretty much any lens ever made, this camera will shoot, as will the Fuji cameras and the Olympus cameras. So a very, very flexible, very, very usable photographic system. And if you like using vintage lenses, there are a few better cameras to use them on than this. The whole quality, the whole character of the lens comes through. There's, of course, no crop factor. And I just love this thing for shooting vintage lenses on. I don't know of a better camera, in fact, to shoot vintage lenses on, all things considered, all round, than this one. Crop sensor bodies... Very, very nice images from vintage lenses, but they don't bring the whole of the image onto the sensor unless you use a focal reducer. But that's added expense, and you've got to buy a different one for each mount. If your interest is primarily in vintage lenses, I would steer you and suggest that you go towards one of these cameras. They're very, very hard wearing, they're very long lasting quality second to none they will last and last and last and for what they are i think these are a serious bargain at the moment so there we are those are my picks for digital mirrorless cameras to shoot vintage lenses on they're very affordable. They start from very, very affordable prices. And even the most expensive one here is not expensive at all when you compare to the prices of newer mirrorless cameras. All of them, I believe, absolute bargains. And all of them will make you some really nice images, whether with modern lenses or the vintage variety, or indeed the new manual focus lenses coming out of China. So that's it from me for today. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and ring that bell before you go. It really does help these smaller channels to gain momentum, to gain traction. And it's always very much appreciated. If you'd like to help the channel to grow and develop, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash sonography. And again, that's very much appreciated and it really helps these smaller channels to gain traction and to become more successful. As ever, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time for some more Xenography. <laughs>